Hello, America. Um, good morning to my friends on the West Coast. Uh, happy midday to my friends on the East Coast. And uh, happy five o'clock <clears throat> to my European friends, or those of us sitting in Madeira Island enjoying a maple whiskey sour. Um, it's five o'clock somewhere, and that somewhere is right here. Cheers, everyone. <clears throat> kind of need that drink this week after, uh, well, the big launch, the big restock of our store. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, sincerely, we appreciate um, all the business that you've entrusted us with. Um, you know, in my view, I work for you. I want to see, I mean, it's been extraordinary to see all the, uh, the growth in the American cut flower world since I've been involved um, on the supply side. And I really appreciate um, each and every one of you, and we are here to support you. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, it was a really great day. Obviously, there are a few little glitches in our computer system. We migrated from one website to what looked like the same website, but in fact, it was an entirely, entirely different system with kind of multiple stores within the store. And there were some little glitches, and I re we really appreciate those of you who reached out and said, hey, here's what's going on. Here's a screenshot of my cart. I'm trying to add this thing, and it's not letting me. Um, we really do appreciate it. And a uh, big shout out to Thomas and Felicia and Allie. Um, our team was, uh, they were great. We were fielded a whole lot of emails. Um, by and large, we got back to people pretty quickly. So uh, thanks for just giving us a chance to solve a problem. Um, as always, if you have a problem, email us, info at farmerbailey.com. We are here to help. Um, if we don't get back to you right away, there's probably a reason. You know, a lot of times if there's a question that requires some real technical information, maybe I need to do some research to answer you properly. Um, it might take me a day or two to do that. So we appreciate your patience. Um, you know, there's really no reason to go on Facebook and ask why Bailey hasn't gotten back to you. The answer is it's not a simple question and I'm trying to give you a real answer. So thanks to those of you. Um, thanks for your patience. Thanks for your help. And certainly thank you for your orders. Um, today, we're going to talk a lot about mums. Um, we have Steve and Mandy from Three Porch Farm. I'm going to bring them in in just a second. Um, I think talking about chrysanthemums will probably take the whole time. But if you have other questions about new varieties we've listed this year. Um, our new vendors, you know, Plug Connection, Three Porch Farm. Clearly, we're still working very well with Grow and Sell. Um, feel free to ask those. We're here to help. Um, and any cultural questions, I'm always available for. All right, let me get Steve and Mandy here. Just a moment. But I think, I think I'm inviting them. Let's see if they show up here in a second. <clears throat> um, oh, here we are. Hi, y'all. Hi. Hey there. Um, if it seems like I'm friendly with Steve and Mandy, that's because we're friends. Perfect. And we've been, I mean, I know we met through the ASCFG. I don't exactly remember when. I feel like we've been friends from the beginning of our beginning. Around 2012 or 13, maybe 13, 14, the teens. We've just started. That. <clears throat> um, this is why I'm always, people like you are the reason I tell people that they need to be involved with the ASCFG because you're flower farmers. You understand the ups and downs of the season and it's great to have someone in your phone. You can just text and say, what is going on with this plant? I need help. Um, I know we've done that with each other and we're not done doing that yet, but today we're going to talk about one of your many successful crops. You are excellent growers and designers and business people. Um, how'd you get into moms? You know, we got into moms when kind of everybody else did. I feel like I remember seeing it first with, um, Jenny Love and, um, Aaron over at Florette and, um, I mean, again, probably in the teens. And, um, you know, so then we've just been growing them as our, our fall crop. Our mar farmer's markets used to go practically year round. So we just always needed flowers. And moms just fill that November gap. Because you're growing in 
Comer, Georgia, I've had the pleasure of visiting. Mm -hmm. um, you have a really long season and you go well into autumn when maybe other summer annuals are fizzling out. So chrysanthemums are a really great product for someone like you. Yeah, and they're great for, you know, the Thanksgiving Day flower yeah. situation. They come in kind of just in time for that. Um, they hold in the cooler really well, too, for, you know, 10 days. So you can really even just kind of even longer, really. We just try to move them quicker. Um, and but they'll still last two to three weeks in the vase. They're pretty amazing in that regard. And last year, I mean, we've been shipping flowers direct to end users for three years now. And last year, the biggest sale we had in any single day was chrysanthemums going out for Thanksgiving. So, um, yeah, we were pretty excited about them then. So we just have so many plants and so many really good varieties as a cut flower. They were just so beautiful with strong stems and Mandy had been kind of like selecting for the best ones for almost a decade now that um, other folks started reaching out saying they were interested where we get them sort of thing. And there, there wasn't that many resources some of them were kind of tough to get into so it seemed like a no-brainer let's start providing these and yeah so we did and it, it seemed like oh there's a bunch of people that want more let's let's get a little bit bigger with this and then uh started leaning into that and connected with you over a couple of drinks and <laughs> here we have it who me <laughs> flowers flower farmers also vacation together <laughs> Yeah, Steve and Mandy came to visit us in Madeira back in July, like in, in contrast to when we were growing in Vermont, we can never leave in the summertime. Um, you can leave in the summertime because it's just so darn hot and no one's really buying flowers anyway. So you really focus on your spring and fall seasons, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Pretty smart. Um, I grew some heirloom mums back in my early days. Um, they're always a little bit tricky for me in northern Vermont because we would generally freeze by September 15th. And I'm sure we'll talk a lot about, about day length, but by then the day length is pretty short in Vermont. It's pretty cold to keep, to get those buds to actually open and develop. <clears throat> um, at that point, I wasn't heating a tunnel. I wasn't actually that confident in how to manage my high tunnel. I think I probably could do it now, um, but uh, I definitely kind of failed a few times with my moms and uh, I wanna talk about how people can succeed. So one of the really interesting things about these heirloom chrysanthemums, well, they're called heirloom because they've been around a long time. Like where, where, where do these varieties come from that you all are selling? You know, I'm not sure where they all originated from. Um, you know, they're cuttings off of cuttings that, that we've gotten um, from a handful, <laughs> well, three different distributors. Uh, and then we just always have kept our mother plants um, throughout the years and you know we've we started off with trying all the beautiful varieties that we found in the catalogs and all of that and some of them just look so gorgeous you want to grow them but they just didn't perform well for us so you know kind of a part, part of making money in flower farming is as you know like you can't be babying certain things too much you want to find what does really well for you what grows really strong what people love and so over those years we've just kind of weeded them down from you know, this, all of the most beautiful ones in the world to like, the ones that are just hardy, get great strong stems. Productive. Productive, yeah, so it's kind of been just acquiring. I haven't done a, a lot of, a deep historical dive into the American chrysanthemum. Um, I think a lot of these are probably exhibition or show varieties that, you know, there's still people in, in the UK who are growing chrysanthemums for sure. Oh, and I, I hope there's still an American Chrysanthemum Society. I honestly don't know if there is. Yeah, they just reached out to us. And uh, uh, funny side note, I looked at their website and uh, saw that last year that the annual mum uh, festival that they put on, the headliner was Nelly. <laughs> oh? <laughs> yeah, this strange, is I think is Sugar Ray. Strange Ray's. bedfellows, yeah. <laughs> was not who I was so we're, in. we're kind of like, maybe we need, we need to be a part of this. Like, they seem like a Fun crowd, maybe. Yeah, why, why aren't we there? Is it now? When does it happen? <laughs> well, I know. Um, Next meetup. <laughs> so coming from a floristry background, my only exposure to moms was, you know, mass produced, kind of boring pink or boring, you know, white and yellow moms from Colombia and Ecuador. By the time I started in floristry in the late 90s, there really wasn't 
cut mum production left in the U.S. I see my mind, was, my, my eyes are kind of open to chrysanthemums in 2000 when I was an intern at Longwood Gardens. They do this amazing chrysanthemum yeah. festival every year, growing all of these specialty old varieties and all of these really intricate training techniques. Um, if you're in that area, anywhere near the Philadelphia, Delaware area, you should uh, definitely try to get to um, Longwood Gardens this fall if you're really passionate about mums because they, they do them like no one else does in the US, I think. Um, so these are old varieties. They were never patented in the first place. So that means you can propagate them. You know, a lot of, a lot of stuff that we're selling that's grown from tissue culture or cutting has a patent on it. You are not legally allowed to take cuttings from this and propagate it. So that's kind of a big difference in what we're selling. Yes, you are selling a really nice, healthy rooted cutting, but it's really a mother plant. You are selling the possibility of propagating your own plants. Exactly. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Can you tell us about, I don't know, how many cuttings can you, how many plants could you produce from one cutting between the time you get it and planting time? Um, I would say from our, if you get ours in April, they grow so fast. So if you just pot those up in say a half gallon pot to start um, with some really good, you know, soil, don't get any like, crazy grocery store crap, like some nice soil, um, give them a good little drink of some fish emulsion. They're going to grow very quickly. When you get, give them a week, most likely, um, you know, they'll start kind of getting, letting them settle in. You can even probably take one cutting off of them in a week. Um, maybe two, maybe three. Sometimes we send them out and you can go ahead and pull two additional cuttings off of them and then once you make that cut then they're going to branch as well so then the next time you can do another cut you know two cuts from that the same shoots uh and it happens they grow really quickly so you can just keep cutting keep cutting i mean how we've always done ours is um is that, well we're growing a lot more mothers now but you know over winter you're one mother after that first initial year over winter one mother two mothers um, that just means dig up your plant in the fall. Yeah, stick like it if you've got 30 of one variety and you don't want to have to baby all of them, just take one or maybe mm -hmm. two and put that in a pot and, and protect that. And then you can take cuttings this next spring and then you have your 30 plants again. Or yeah, then that just, you can take so many cuttings off of one mother plant. But that initial, that initial plant that we send out, I would say for every one, you could probably do three or four before it's time for you to stick them in the ground rooted. Um, we typically are always late to plant hours, uh, late, but June seems just fine for us. Mid-June seems totally fine um, for us to get through, you know, to develop a really full plant okay. in the tunnel. So. so say you're getting them in April, you've got almost a couple months to be propagating from these. And you can take a cutting and then it's going to branch, you're going to get multiple cuttings again. But then that cutting that you've rooted... And they root really fast and they're really easy. Yeah. Um, you can take cuttings off yeah. that and then that's on a branch and you can take cuttings off that. So totally. they, they multiply pretty fast. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've gotten a couple questions about how hardy are they? Because I've, I've had them in Vermont, we would have them over winter in our unheated high tunnel, but it'd be pretty late when they would start sprouting in the springtime. So what I did was actually start growing a mother plant in its own pot that I could keep more protected and then I could, you know, bring that into a warm area earlier in the spring. As long as they have long, you know, more than 14 hours of daylight, they're going to just keep growing vegetatively. You can harvest cuttings off that. It'll put out a new flush. You can harvest those cuttings. Then you start harvesting cuttings from your cuttings. Um, I think there's probably, well, I remember my plant propagation class at University of Kentucky. I don't know how many mums we propagated because they are just kind of the classic example of an easy to root, easy to propagate thing. Totally. And they're one of those things, too, that, I mean, you don't have to really baby them. We do cuts of them. You know, they'll kind of like even wilt down and you're like, oh, my gosh, they're going to die. And then, you know, hit them with some water. Th two days, three days, they'd like pop right back up. They're, they're literally the most durable plant. <laughs> we, we, we wouldn't be messing around with too many, like, finicky, finicky things. <laughs> I believe that with uh, every order, you put a little card with propagation directions or a link to a video that people can watch. Um, great, and we're you know we're here to help with that too. Um, 
if you've ever taken a cutting of something, here's a really great place to start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Expl you feel very confident after propagating mums. You're like, you can then venture into other things that are a little bit more tedious. Yeah, they make you feel yeah. good. Um, <clears throat> so I talked a little bit about day length. Chrysanthemums are sort of the classic short day flower. They initiate their flower buds under the shortening days as we go towards autumn. That's the classic example of something that you could keep growing vegetatively and never have it flower by keeping the lights on. You know, sometimes if you're planting under a bright street light or a porch light, they might not actually flower because they think it's just summer. They're not reading the cues to, you know, start making those buds. So that's the reason that they flower in fall because our day length is decreasing. It tells the plant, hey, you better get flowering. Um, do they all bloom at the same time? No, they stagger um, within a month. No, about a month. I mean, you know, we, we harvest off of them for about six weeks. We have in the tunnel right now, um, it's a new variety to us. It's just like, just kind of starting to open a little bit. Um, buds are all formed on things, but um, yeah. And that, that's also to say too, we don't really grow a lot of the late bloomers because by the time they're blooming, that Thanksgiving's over, that color palette's out. So, um, you know, ones that we do hold on, there may be a little bit later bloomers are ones that are like whites or reds, things that we can move on into the holidays. So that is kind of one thing to note when buying mums from anyone is like how, if they're a late bloomer, if they're an early bloomer, um, that like light purple that we have, that's one of the first that comes in for us, which is nice because we can kind of tuck that in to end of summer, kind of still working into fall vibes. But what we found is that people really want those like fall colors October, end of October, leading up until Thanksgiving-ish, and then they don't want to see any more orange or browns or anything like that. So, like, usually this, the, the Vesuvio does really well for us, that Crimson Tide, those we can, like, really work into more holidays. And those are blooming later, so it works for us. Great. So if you had the, ha say, if you had the same variety planted, well, from Vermont all the way down into Georgia, Vermont's days get shorter sooner in the fall. You, we have a bigger, we had a bigger difference in our day length, um, just longest to shortest days of the year. So our day length starts to decline sooner, thus the flowers will bloom sooner. So you can't exactly say that this variety blooms on this date. It's really going to be relative to where you are and the conditions they are receiving. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and it's fun now to start seeing uh, folks up north, you know, starting their flowers are just kind of starting to open a little bit more, you know, and it's, it actually like gets me excited for our crop to go. I like to be able to follow the shorter day length flowering things from the up north growers where we tend to start off the spring with poppies and yeah, it's kind of cool. <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> so the reason that these are grown in such huge numbers, especially in equatorial regions, is that they're really easy to manipulate to get them to flower just by controlling their day length. Now in those facilities, they are pulling a blackout fabric over the greenhouses so that they think that the days are getting shorter. It doesn't matter what the actual daylight is doing. You could do this. I don't know many people doing day length work in America beyond the cannabis growers, yeah. um, but it is possible if you really wanted to have a year long mum program that is doable, but I really like that we've embraced them as, well, that, let me back up. That, that's kind of contributed to their image problem as being a cheap grocery store flower. I think there was a time where they were just viewed as a really special way to celebrate autumn. And I like that this flower farmer movement has really brought that back. That there's people waiting all year for mum season. And they're not buying them all year, but they're buying them when they're at their best, when they're going to last the longest. Um, so yeah, I think you're right about the, the getting the colors right. People want those, you know, warm autumn colors. Um, and I think they're just a really great way to celebrate fall. What other flowers can you have along with them if you were making bouquets? You know, <clears throat> we usually mix ours with eucalyptus. You okay. know, that, col that color just looks really well um, with eucalyptus. So we tend to hold on to our eucalyptus um, until then, because then the eucalyptus is really hardened off too, you know, for in our experience, you know, we see people cutting eucalyptus all the time, but I feel like in our experience, when it's just when it, if it's not later in the season, then the, it just doesn't hold. So 
it actually pairs really well okay like that um we usually have like jewels of opar and things happening about that time too that we can you know mix in with things but okay. we don't really do mixed bouquets too much anymore so right. we still sell uh, thanksgiving bouquets but they're so full with mums and just yeah. a few sprigs of eucalyptus that they are really bountiful feeling and and yeah they were huge hit last year mm -hmm. it was really predominantly just moms and maple leaves obviously gorgeous if they're still around in your area um little grass plumes we grow some different like little fountain type grasses those always just look really really good in them um no, but I love moms our, our, I'm sorry, our, our flowering that? kale was always looking really good at the same time the moms were because we're getting cool nights yeah. the kale would color up it's perfect for cutting then. <clears throat> um, Salvia leucantha, if you have it. Um, this uh, caryopteris that we're selling now. It's kind of in flower now. It might be just a little bit ahead of the mums, but uh, mm -hmm. if you get an early variety, they might overlap and it would be a really nice, a nice complement. Mm -hmm. um, also a short day plant that waits for the days to get a little bit short until they start to bloom. Um, I'm gonna go to, we got a lot of questions. People are fired up about heirloom mums. So. Hope I've got the answer. <clears throat> so we've had a lot of questions about disbudding and questions about pinching, and they're not the same thing. So let's talk about pinching because it's going to happen earlier in the life of the plant. Mm -hmm. um, so you said you you, know, you want to get them in the ground by June. June, yeah, get them in the ground by June, um, and we pinch until I, I push it every year and I encourage people to push, you know, take a, take one plant out of say your 10 and like hack it back mid July, depending where you are. If you're in the South, you can cut them. I'm, I'm so scared to say, you know, these like exact things, yeah. but I'm a risk taker. Um, I've cut our, our tall varieties. So like those, the Kelvins, the Safinas, um, we cut those back to this tall into the end of July, beginning of August, and they're already five feet tall still. So <laughs> we can really pinch those back. I can't think of one variety that I wouldn't encourage people to pinch multiple times and and take them down to, let's just say, five or six inches just to you know, a little buffer there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> put them down hard until I'm just, I just always say like mid July because I'm so afraid of telling people, you know, get making people stress out about it because they will shoot up. And if you don't pinch them, they are going to get unruly and huge. And then you're going to have flopping stems and then you're going to have just wads of flowers on top and it's going to be unmanageable. So, for me, I personally really like to take the risk of having them shorter, you know, chopping them back, pinching them hard um, later in the season. Because even, even if we got three foot stems, two foot stems out of these like massive plants, that's still all we need. I don't need, you know, this like crazy tall, <laughs> toppling over <clears throat> plant. Um, I'm sure most people know this, but just in case there's like really brand new farmers that they don't understand what we're talking about with pinching. So all, all the growth hormones are in the, what the, the typical meristem or something like that top bud of a plant. And, and when you cut that or pinch it, those hormones, those growth hormones go to the side. So it causes a bushier growth pattern. So it can give you more flowers basically is the, is the goal. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So not every plant is the same, but things like mums. That tend to want to grow upright. You have the apical mar meristem, and then you'll, you'll have your leaves, your leaves off to the side, and in each little I wonder, node, say, node. I was going to say crotch, but that's vulgar. Um, <laughs> you, there are buds in there, but they are they are controlled by the hormones being released from the apical meristem. If you pinch that out, there's nothing preventing them from growing anymore, and they're all going to break. And that's how you start to get you know four or six more branches forming. If you do nothing, it's gonna just keep growing upwards. And that apical meristem will exert its dominance over all of the other little, you know, they call latent meristems that are not um, 
they don't have permission to grow yet. So you could grow a six foot stem if you wanted, just grow one big one. And that's really what the exhibition people mm -hmm. do. They're not pinching and these things get very tall and they need a bamboo stake and all sorts of supports and it's cool, but it's not really for production. Yeah. Um, so you pinch once and then, and is that it? Or you, you said you would go back and pinch again. How many stems ultimately are you looking for this plant to support? I am mostly looking for the plant to be able to support its weight. Um, and also every time you're pinching, you're, you're getting that more branching. So you're getting more stems to cut. Um, I would say with some of our varieties, so we'll pinch it say, you know, three, four inches tall. We'll just go ahead and start pinching. There's no need to kind of wait pinch that back a bit, just say take an inch off, let it grow out maybe to say six inches. Cause that time it's after you planted your, the roots have established, uh, you know, in your garden beds. Um, then when it's six inches, I'll take it back down to three inches. We'll let it grow. Now I've got like more stems coming up. Gonna let it grow out even could be another six inches and keep cutting it so, back. There's no need so to So when keep... you're cutting that second time, just, just to give people a clearer picture, and you say it got up to six inches, now you've got more branches, you cut it back down to three, you're not cutting it below those new branches, right? You're cutting maybe each of yeah, those cutting, branches. Yeah, cutting each of those branches in half. So just kind of taking everything down by half each time I'm pinching. So one, one branch kind of becomes three after that first one, and then the next time those three become nine, yeah. Because you're you're doing the same thing to all of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, kind of building a structure that will support the flowers. Yeah. I'm guessing and I'm not I'm not pinching a plant that's, you know, two feet tall. I, I want to be pinching before that they get two feet tall. There's no point in having the plant expend all that energy and um so I just kinda keep I'd like to keep our plants maybe six inches tall. About eight. About eight six six inches, eight inches tall. Um for us until August, and then I'll kind of let them go. Okay. Even mid-August this year, some were getting a little, a little tall, a little crazy. I just went and pinched those back too, and I'm kind of seeing too about getting a little bit of a staggering bloom in that situation of pinching some back a little bit harder later in the season. Um, so that's a little bit to be determined, but I have a feeling that that will be kind of just fine. Once buds start forming, I've, we've had some people ask us, you know, send pictures of buds already all on the stems and they're like, do I pinch now? And no, you do not want to pinch when you see any bud formation. Um, stay away from, I'm just going to say, stay away from pinching mid-August on really mid-July, just to cover my... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the more north you are, probably the, the yeah. earlier you want. So the stop. traditional wisdom is, you know, pinch, do your last pinch on the 4th of July. But I think that's really more for northern growers. So yeah. that we're going to get lower, uh, lower, shorter day length sooner. Yeah. So we need to pinch sooner in the north. You're, you know, quite a bit further south. You can go to late July, even maybe even early August. And the plant is still going to have enough time. If you do it too late, then they'll, they'll still bloom, but they might be six sure. inches. So if you're having trouble with your mums getting too tall, um, even if you put three layers of support netting and they're still toppling over, maybe consider a later pinch next year. That would be a really good way to control your height. And every variety is going to act differently in every environment. So some of this is just going to be a little bit of trial and error. Yeah. yeah. Um, hopefully you get it right more or less the first time, but you can fine tune as you go on, you know, with, temperature and rainfall and everything else all over the place. Um, the one thing that is not changing is day length and when, you know, when your day is going to be 12 hours or 11 hours or 10 hours long, that's going to be the same based on your latitude regardless. Yeah. So, uh, and, and that's to, to stop pinching. You should be pinching multiple times up until that date, up until great. say like July or in our case, August. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, moms are, really forgiving in these earlier months of their growth. Um, so they're also just, you know, they're, they're a good one to experiment with again, in terms of making your own cuttings as far as like something to dive into for a later season bloom. Like even if they get hit by a little bit of frost coverage, some of them look just fine. Um, some of the lighter colored ones say that um, this Evan Dreams, they'll get nipped a little bit. Um, the color will kind of change some, but they're very 
a hearty forgiving plant. So I super encourage people to just, especially if they've had tall plants this year, just keep cutting those things back and you know, you're going to get more stems, healthier, stockier plant. I just, I can't imagine any of ours blooming on little stems, no matter what, because they're so <laughs> bigger, <laughs> just they're already giants when I'm trying to keep them, some of those varieties down. Great. So I will say one thing there, mums will bloom if they're exposed to a weird cold snap. So we saw that in Vermont. Sometimes we start seeing flowers in June because they were growing maybe kind of a warm high tunnel and then we opened up the sides of the high tunnel you know as temperatures got too warm and then we have a night in the 40s or a couple of nights in the 40s so you might see a few blooms especially in the northern region you might see a couple early blooms that's because they got a an unexpected chill probably not a problem for you in georgia but it will happen on occasion if you are in a place that might drop into the 40s in the summertime <clears throat> Yeah, we actually, um, I took two of our varieties out of production this year because they were doing that in the spring, even just as little cuts. They would get a little bit of that chill and then want to start initiating flower. And again, for us, that's just not anything we really want to deal with. It wasn't a variety, two varieties that, um, you know, we wanted to spend a headache on. They weren't, they weren't beautiful enough. <laughs> Great. I really love do. your selections. I was looking through them the other day. I'm like, oh, I, I want all these. You know, I used to yeah. draw all of them. Any cool, weird spidery thing with really long petals that I'm sure get bruised the second you cut them. Um, that's what I was trying to grow. But I'm like, you picked a really nice, I can tell these varieties all work. They're, the colors yeah. are great. The form is great. <clears throat> um, okay, so we planted, we pinched a bunch. Obviously, summer solstice is in June. They start getting shorter starting in July. Northern growers, Stop pinching probably July 4th. The further south you are, you can push that a little bit, maybe into early August if you are, say, um, in North Georgia or like we're on the, I know Atlanta's on the 33rd parallel because that's what we are here in Madeira. I think that's kind of a, that'd be a, a good time to stop pinching by, you know, late July, early August. And, and I will say too, look at the descriptions as well. And, um, they're on the website, the product page, and it has the stem height. And with those taller ones, again, that those, um, the Kelvins, things like that, like those are ones that you can really kind of get away with going a little a later bit harder. Yeah. There's, there's very vigorous. Yeah. Okay. Great. So there's a long period where they're just green. Um, they want to be warm, I think. They like the, they don't mind, they don't bat an eye at the heat of the south. No, they don't. How much you need to water and feed them? Are they hungry? Um, they really aren't that hungry. We're feeding them more kind of than ever right now. We're sort of trying to feed everything a little bit more. I think we've always been like pretty... We're just kind of testing. Testing, yeah, we're testing doing it more out. Testing. Uh, our spring flowers, we noticed that we fertigated them with some bloom and stuff this year, and we noticed a significant in improvement. So we're kind of testing things that we've never fed before, but we've, yeah. never, we've fed never fed them, them in the past. Besides um, the initial, you know, like bed prep, um, we use an organic um, symphony as the brand, the fertilizer that we use, you know, always soil test where you're planting before, make sure there's good nutrients and the pH is, is good. Um, but you really can get away with very minimal nutrients. They seem to also be loving a little bit of a, of a flower and rose fish emulsion, which we're using Neptunes at the moment. Right. And I think we've actually fed them once, right? Yeah. Only fed them once, and I don't give them, after that initial, um, you know, prepping the beds, putting the nitrogen in, I'm not giving them a lot of nitrogen because they're already so vigorous that I'm kind of like, you know, keep it down, keep it down. Uh, and, and, and this fertigation with them is just a test. I mean, this stuff is pretty expensive. So if we don't, I mean, we don't really need to. We know we, we've grown them for about a decade and they're so productive without anything. This is really just her kind of seeing what will happen. So don't feel like you need to. They, they're, as long as your beds are mended appropriately, right pH, right nutrient complex, you're good to go. You don't need to do anything else. So keep the aphids off. Aphids. And so that's the other thing too with, um, we use a lot of fish product and, you know, aphids are drawn to the smell of fish. So there is a little bit of, I know, why? We're this. Um, I mean, you know, aphids are from the sea. Everybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> They're just tiny little shrimp. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So as far as like foliar spraying them, because literally this time of year, it's like moth to a flame, like aphids are going to find your mom's. Um, I would not recommend foliaring any sort of fish with them. Um, if you're going to do anything, do it through your drip system uh, or just kind of apply by hand, depending on your scale. Okay. Uh, so I know, I know you all are, you're not certified organic, but you use organic practices and you are probably some of the best land stewards and environmental stewards I know. Um, so I know you've done your soil test and you're doing cover cropping and you're being really good to your soil. So it's pretty rich to start with. Um, I think many, many, many plants, the beginning of their life, they're going to use more nitrogen. Nitrogen promotes green growth. It promotes stems. If you do it too much, then you're going to get something that's really tall and probably pretty weak. Yeah. So basis... People sometimes say, what should I be fertilizing with? I'm like, it depends entirely on that soil test and on your water as well. We could do a whole five more sessions just about soil tests and irrigation and fertilization. And I am not quite qualified to lead those sessions, but I would like to maybe bring in someone who is. Um, they do want a little higher nitrogen in the beginning. And then as they're getting closer to bloom, plants use more phosphorus. So NPK, that high middle number, that's, you know, if you see a bloom booster fertilizer, it would generally be a chemical fertilizer, but there are organic versions of it. Um, that's when they're going to be consuming the phosphorus. So a balanced soil, you're probably not going to need to do much, but the plant needs a little more nitrogen early in life. And then as it's going into flower, probably a little more phosphorus, but a yeah. generally balanced, you know, well composted, well maintained soil is probably about all these moms are going to need. Um, okay, I mean, so I, we, for, a few, for a few years earlier on, um, we were like, I don't know, didn't have, you know, our potting mix was like so precious to us. And I knew that moms were so, so hardy that like, I remember the early days, we literally would like throw them, our mother plants into like sandy soil that we like got out from the yard. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> they, they can tolerate some some uh, less than ideal nutrient imbalances and stuff too. So again, like just an easier flower to grow for you, not super, super big. Though I recommend always having a really great fertilization and, and soil testing and uh, nutrient rich bed to begin with. Just <laughs> illustrating how hardy they are. <laughs> just so, illustrating their hardiness. All right, let's see if we go to the next question, yeah. So um, aphids are probably the biggest problem you're gonna have. For us, aphids um, get anything. Learn about aphids. Learn about their life cycle. Learn about how fast they reproduce. Learn about the products you can use and the beneficials you can use. Um, aphids are really easy to kill, but they're also really fast to multiply and they can hide in every nook and cranny. So we're not going to talk about aphids. Just know that they're probably going to be an issue, but they're an issue for a lot of crops. Um, and to spread spray them good multiple times before they those flowers start opening because you'll yeah. never get ahead of them once those petals start opening we, we will say um very quickly we alternate every week with some you know hippie organic omri certified chemical um generally soap venerate grand Devo, these things that are aren't that aggressive um and then right before all the blooms start to open up We'll go through with like five backpack fulls of Piganic, which is Omri certified organic, but it's the strongest knockdown one. And if you hit them that hard right as they're about to open up, by the time they're flowering, the population is so decimated, the population of aphids is so decimated that you're not really going to be see them, seeing them crawling around on your open blooms when you're doing bouquets. And that, that's been the best approach we've had at making mm -hmm. them kind of a non-issue for our customers. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> Piganic is very strong. It's derived from a chrysanthemum relative, <laughs> um, but it kills a lot of things and it is an organic naturally occurring thing. So great. So now we're getting to budding time. So we've, we planted, we pinched, that's nice vegetative growth. They're starting to get tall. And then as you know, September, probably start seeing some buds forming right now, probably pretty full of buds, depending on the variety and where you are. This is when we need to talk about disbudding. So what is disbudding? Disbudding, removing those outer small buds so you then have a big central flower. To, and all to say, we do not disbud any of ours. Okay. We keep them all as spray. All of your varieties have been bred to, or selected for their 
performance without disbutting. So if you are similar to the, uh, you know, pinching out the apical merosim to make the side shoots break, if you were to pinch out the bud, the flower bud, once it has formed from the tip, you will see more lateral growth. Um, you get maybe a little more uniform spray type flower. This budding usually refers to if you're wanting one really big flower, you're going to go through and pick off all those little side buds. You can do that if you want, you know, if you really want some large focal size flowers. Um, you can also pinch out that first bud to encourage more laterals, or you can do neither, and they're probably going to be beautiful and usable regardless. That's the most so, way. <laughs> I mean, I'll say like our Seton's coffee would love to be disbudded, um, but on, you know, that's one that would really perform well and just be this like gorgeous spider mom. But for me personally, and I, I think it just all comes to personal taste too, like I love the tiny little spiders on the side, you know, you still have this like big, beautiful one. And if you wanted to pull those sad ones off and put those little bud bases, you're still going to get a really nice, in my opinion, big, beautiful flower out of it. So we just leave them. Yeah, this is where it's fun to, fun to experiment, you know, yeah. just pick a couple plants and tie a little ribbon on it so you know what you've done to it. But pinch out the central bud and pinch off the side buds and see what happens. They're going to be beautiful and usable regardless. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of confusion around pinching and disbudding. I think pinching is something you do to a green plant. And disbudding is something you do to a flower that's making flower buds. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and there's a lot of applications for this body. You can do it in lisianthus, so you want fewer but larger flowers. Um, it's really just kind of funneling the resources of the plant where you want them. Um, but it's not really that necessary. And you've done the work for us by selecting varieties that are fine without being disbudded. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I would say the Crimson Tide and the Seton's Coffee, you, you know, are ones that that you can play around with definitely like the um the kelvins and stuff i just don't think they need anything okay. need to, yeah they're just going to be a nice even spray nothing crowding each other too much yeah, we don't do it for any of them we don't do it for any of them okay. good um a few questions i'm gonna rapid fire here um golden hour dahlia asks how do these hold up in a vase do they last like forever, like you're going to be tired of them more and just throw them away. Up to three weeks. Yeah. 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 Especially when they're harvested locally, fresh, yeah. and gone, you know, right where they're enjoyed. They're not shipped around the world. Um, they last a really long time. Um, I've got a couple questions about overwintering. Like I said, Vermont, we were really a zone three winter in an unheated tunnel. They would often come back um, warmer than that. They're going to probably come back, but maybe from a management standpoint, it's better to have some mother plants in a pot just to make sure if you have that weird free freeze, maybe you've had a warm spell where they start growing and then you get a really late freeze that might knock them back too much. <clears throat> so keep a few mother plants as a backup plan. Yeah. Um, and, and they could be dormant too, even in the garage and, you know, people put them in the garage in their spaces. They're still forming so many roots, like, and then in the spring, when you bring them out, you're just going to have so many new little shoots coming up. But yeah, just to be on the safe side of things, holds them back to, um, you know, make sure they don't get snapped. Ours, we had some, I did an experiment last year where we got down to seven degrees. They were in pots. It was totally, minus 10 with the wind chill. So yeah. It was pretty cold for here. Yeah. Frozen solid pots and they did just fine. That was for a three day span. I'm not saying to do that. Um, we definitely are telling everyone to err on the side of caution, protect some other plants, and then experiment too. Like, see what you can get away with. Like, right. Yeah. So, if they overwinter in your climate, would you recommend growing them as a perennial? Like, that just stays in the same place? I would. They get too, just too congested. Yeah, snails and things and stuff. Um, you know, it's expensive for space too. If you're growing in a tunnel to have that tunnel taken up by one crop that only flowers for like one month every year you just wasted a lot of money and potential so yeah we always dig them up put them in pots put them somewhere that's conveniently out of the way for us and if we're getting a really cold snap cover them with some remay or something like that but um, that's kind of how we approach it yeah i mean you might want again put some put one of your plants or something in your yard and, and see what happens. Throw some leaf layer or something on top of it if it gets real cold. 
experiment with it, but from some friends that I've had in the area um, with with other types of moms, they didn't get them from us, but they just said they didn't really do very well. So we just kind of tell everybody. Do them yeah, up. I think they're so vigorous and such fast. I mean, vigorous equals fast growing. Um, I feel like they just get kind of congested in the bed, and so they're they're better kind of grown as a, a new young plant every year. Which you can also produce just by digging up that plant in the fall, keeping it in a protected place, take cuttings off that next spring. Mm -hmm. And then you've got time to squeeze in, I don't know, a ranunculus crop or anemones or tulips or whatever, whatever you want for the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, great. Um, I know we can't ship cuttings into California. Um, I'm assuming the California inspectors probably have just stopped and destroyed too many of your deliveries. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, California. We've got a couple of people who have been excited to order and then they get to check out and realize they can't. Um, yeah. We tried to put it in as big lettering as we could, like, sorry, not for California. We break um, parts every day. Super it's, depressing. Yeah. My whole family is in California and not being able to ship my mom flowers on my <laughs> Real pain in the ass. But. Uh, yeah, we've had, oh, wow, like untold thousands of dollars of you know, like whole pallets of plugs get stopped. And actually what the inspectors are seeing are beneficial insects that are there to control the bad insects. But rather than asking like, what are these? They destroyed the entire delivery. Um, thankfully not all the time, but that has happened. So yeah, um, they, sorry, California. They've called us up and just specifically said, do not ship anything to California anymore. And we've talked with our department back, really tried to work every angle we could. And it's, there's, there's no angle yeah. for us to really work. Yeah. Unless they're going to pay $350 per box. It was box. 250 a box. They said they could <laughs> give us some permission. But, you know, most of the boxes cost like $69. So <laughs> the 250 markup on top of that is, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, yeah ahead, economics please. don't really work out. Um, Okay, we talked about this budding, we talked about California. <laughs> um, so you come to at least half their growth in July, but I think you said you want them down to a pretty, I don't know, probably under a foot tall by your final pinch. You want to be fairly yeah. compact yeah. at that last time of your last pinch. If you keep pinching tall, they're going to just keep getting taller and taller, and you'll end up with a five foot thing. So, yeah, <clears throat> yeah just bring that plant back down, you know, six inches from the soil line. I love it. Um, a lot about, okay, sorry, I've got a long question here. One second. <clears throat> so Stacey Stewart says she's researched heirloom mums and it's difficult to find information on how and when to disbud each variety. <clears throat> um, I think it's going to probably be based on if it's a early mid season or late variety. Most of what you're selling are early to mid season. I believe um, not too many late ones there. Someone bought an online booklet from a seller and didn't teach them anything. I think these things are so difficult because it's going to depend so much on where you are, the temperatures you're getting, the day length, the light intensity you've got, even the mm -hmm. temperature at bloom time. In Vermont, we would have them in bud and then we would just run out of heat and that bud would just sit there mm -hmm. until November, even into December, and it probably wouldn't open. Yeah. Um, I think keeping keeping them warm into the blooming time is important. They need some, they need some warmth to finish. Um, so if you're a northern grower, you're really going to need to put these in a high tunnel. Yeah. They're not, um, maybe in your area, can you grow them in the field? Do people yeah. do that down there? People okay. do. No. Yeah. Not a big deal. Um, and, and we've had some, we always have some flower out in pots and stuff. And again, that issue is if we do get a frost, we have gotten frost last year, it was October 15th. Um, you're going to want to protect those blooms. Again, some of the darker colored ones, you won't notice that they've gotten a little frost nipped, but some of those lighter varieties uh, will just be like a little bit of browning on the, the petals. So even, I mean, if they're starting to sort of unfurl, once you see that petal color, they can be damaged. Um, I honestly don't know about if they get hit by frost in bud stage I would assume they would even be more protected uh, if you are a bit followed up by more warm days. I assume that they would, they would be just fine. The oh, yeah. Plants would be fine. Yeah. yeah. In an ideal world, you won't have your budded plants getting frosted. Yeah. Um, they, they still want some real warmth above 55 to keep developing properly. Yeah. Um, you might get partial blooms or kind of misshapen flowers, but 
you can keep them nice and warm, you're going to get nice full flowers. Um, someone wants to know number of stems per plant, but I think it's more about stems per area, because if you plant them close, they're going to compete and they're, they're not, they won't produce so many. What, what kind of spacing do you recommend? What I recommend and what I do is two different things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also have a reputation of ignoring spacing requirements and packing things in. Um, ours are currently at about six to seven inch spacing. Okay from our plug that is not, if, if we were to plant one of our mothers, I would give a foot, at least a foot spacing, maybe even a foot and a half, because then you're, you're already working with like a big root ball. Um, but for our plugs, um, I plant them out the same as everybody gets theirs. Those little plugs, um, six inch spacing, they're packed pretty tight in there, getting about average, say, five to 10 stems per plant. And what I can do after this actually is go to our tunnels and do some videos. I'll put it on our Instagram, do some videos of what our plants look like now. Um, I have been doing almost like weekly, like a, everybody make sure they're checking out their aphids. So I know some people will follow up along with, with our chrysanthemums from the beginning, but this will be, um, I'll go back through and kind of show the height of some of these plants, even though I've just been like, cutting them to the ground. Great. But, um, yeah. yeah, obviously tag us when you do that. We'll make sure we repost it. I think it's really fun to, to grow along and see what other people, we encourage all of our growers, like just tag us, show us what you're doing. Yeah. Because I think it's a really great way. And I, I can be a visual learner and it's really fun to see like, oh, what's, what's this look like in someone else's situation? Yeah. Um, I would say yeah, just for our tunnel, we do have fans. We are, we monitor watering. We're not, you know, when you're pet tight like that, you really do just have to keep your eye on, as with any plants, you know, disease, anything like that. Again, chrysanthemums are, they're just so durable. We don't ever have any issues with them, knock on wood, wherever all of that is. But um, yeah, so airflow is still really important, even if you pack them in as tight as Great. they do. We have had questions about white rust come in since we kind of announced our, our partnership and that we're expanding into mum production. And uh, for anybody out there who's interested in white rust, we literally just heard about it for the first time recently because we've never had it. Our only issue has ever been aphids. Um, and that might be a function of where we're at. Our and climate doesn't really lend itself to it as much. Yeah, yeah so um, we don't really have tips on white rust and it's not in our stock at all. Great. We it is in America, it's not super widespread. It's something you should talk with your local uh, plant pathologist about. Um, if you think you have something that looks like white rust, um, we're no doubt importing it on our cut flowers all the time. It's, you know, it, it, it exists in the world. Um, there's a reason we can't bring in propagation material from other countries because of white rust, but we can bring in millions and millions of stems of cut flowers, which would easily be infected with white rust. So I don't quite understand the guidelines. That's for another day. Um, Liz, flower farmer, I believe this is Liz Krieg. What is your general cut stem length? It sounds like you have to, you have know, the problem with too much stem length. Um, we do. Yeah. So we're actually cutting to fit into the boxes that we ship. So, um, again, on some of these varieties, if you want a five or six foot tall stem, you can have that, <laughs> um, plenty of stem length. Right. So uh, this is in Vermont. I think maybe it's harder to get a real long stem if you're in a cold place, unless you're really keeping your high tunnels buttoned down and, and get it nice and warm in there. Um, yeah, I used to get you know, 24 inches, not, not giant. Mm -hmm. But uh, try to try to emulate a Georgia summer climate, and I think you'll get some really tall stems. And variety too. Again, on the product page, um, there's the heights that they get to, so you know you can select for for taller plants if if that's a concern. Great. Um, someone called Mimo loves flowers. Uh, of course, is our, our our dear friend Mima Davis from Urban Buds out in St. Louis. Can't wait to see you in St. Louis, Mimo, and your team in November. Y'all going? Possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mimo, have you ever had mealy, have you ever had mealy bugs on moms? <laughs> if yes, how did you get rid of them? It's crazy that they've seen that, that she says. No, um, I haven't. But I know, I mean, this, this is, I guess, I know she works out of a glass house too, right? Mm -hmm. I know, I anytime, so. anytime. Um, 
I have ever been in a glass house, there has been mealybug issues. I had a job of just swabbing off with oil and Q-tips mealybugs. If that is nothing anybody wants to do. Um, there are some uh, beneficials I know that we used to put in this glass house, this fancy farm I worked at, but I cannot remember. You can reach out to IPM Labs in the Northeast where you're at. That's, I think they're out of Moravia, New York. That's where we get all of our beneficials from, IPM Labs. They're very helpful. Yeah, I used to use them quite a lot. <clears throat> um, yeah, maybe we'll talk about it. We actually, here in Madeira, we actually, we have a lot of mealybugs. We have mealybugs on our beech trees, mealybugs and things you would never expect. Um, also, we have predators that eat them, so they don't really get out of control. But I think in a place that's in production all year long, where you're not getting a freeze, you're never having a moment where you're free of any mealybugs, um, probably some predators are going to be your best, best option. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Do they need to be... Oh, do they, when you have your mother plant in a pot, do, um, pug, pug, pug patch flower farm asks, do they need to be watered regularly or at all when they're dormant in, in the garage over winter? Over Very winter. rarely. So rarely. Yeah. You know, check on them every three weeks or something, you know, along with your like dahlia tubers or something, you know, store them where you're storing your tubers, you know. Great. Yeah. Um, another question about white rust, aphids, mealybugs. We can talk about viruses. Do they? Do we see much evidence of virus? You haven't seen anything. Never seen it. Um, a virus is the only problem when it's a problem. There's a lot of things that are virus. Even tulips are virus on purpose because they get the fun streaks in them. I have a hunch that all those pink cafe au lait dahlias are actually virus because we're selling virus-free cafe au laits that are mostly blooming cream. <laughs> um, not all viruses have a negative effect. They can just exist in the plant. Um, it's usually the mosaic viruses are the ones that generally will weaken the plant. Um, someone asked, when can we expect a restock of sold out varieties? I believe you restocked some today? Did some restocking today. Okay. Um, we are going to do a restock in November. I want to okay. see everything blooming out and really get my eyes on everything um, and then do a restock. But yeah, I'm going to say Let's go like the week after Thanksgiving. Okay, great. Our tunnel, our tunnel will be down. We'll be able to see all the things. Um, and so if you haven't been able to get what you want, don't despair. They may well come back into okay. stock. I know you all being really conservative and not over promising or over under promise, over deliver. I think that's what you do. Um, you aren't over promising. You're being really cautious. So uh, exactly, we're being so cautious. You can. I'm sure that you can. Um, bank on a couple of restocks. <laughs> Great. Um, and I, hold on one sec. Thomas, can people do the, uh, notify me for their products too? So we have the little feature in our store where you can click to be notified when something comes back into stock. Um, just do that. And then you will find out you'll be the first one. Um, we don't make a big deal when things are restocked. So, you know, if you're one of the handful or 20 or 30 people who have click that button, you will be notified and nobody else will. So you can get in there and get those plants. Um, as a side note, anything in the store that you want and you didn't get this year, hit that button. It really helps us project what we need to be, how many plants we need to be growing for the following seasons or where the demand is that, you know, maybe we don't know. We're pretty good at knowing what people want, but sometimes we don't fully understand. So uh, that little feature does help us in a couple of ways. Anything else you need? say about the mom these are the only questions i have so far oh um linda doan says that you all should be coming to st louis for asc <laughs> have you ever, ever said no to linda doan i have actually she's that's why she's going through you <laughs> <laughs> well i can't um, yeah. any uh anything we missed on the mom discussion you think uh, um i can't think of anything but i will i'll do some videos okay. and um, kind of keep people in the loop. We'll definitely do some like once things are in bloom, we'll do some more, um, you know, videos through walking through the tunnels. And uh, one thing about the chrysanthemums, they have to be trellised. They we put one layer at least of the hordo netting over them. Um, we use baling twine along the sides. 
especially as flowers start to open up, they're going to weigh down, cinch them. I can't express them. So we get rebar them. stakes from Tractor Supply. They've got little welded fins on the bottom, so you can kind of push them in the ground with your feet. They're about three foot tall. We use Horta Nova netting, and um, sometimes we'll do a second layer on the rebar. The rebar is probably placed every four feet, basically one pace or so. We we put a second, you know, put another piece of rebar. And then, like she said, below the level of the Horta Nova netting, if some of those side branches want to fall out, that's when we come around with baling twine and basically just kind of wrap it so all those outside ones, they cinch in like that. So We're going to be doing, the aisles. Yeah. yeah, tomorrow on the list actually is to do like the fourth layer, the fourth string going up just to keep cinching things keep cinching things i don't mind them to open up a little bit as they're growing again for airflow i don't want everything like so tight all the time but now that the buds are coming on i don't want any sort of you know bent stem so they're going to get a probably their final cinching uh this week i'm trying to think of a crop that needs trellising or netting or supporting more than mums for I mean, us sometimes be... dahlias unfortunately sometimes dahlias yeah. But they're really right up there with more. some of the crops that you just need to suck it up and give them a lot of support. Because once they fall over, you can't get them back up right. No. Nobody wants um, a right angle flower. <laughs> what's that? Nobody wants a right angle flower. <laughs> Lots of buds. Some people think they do, but they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Mandy and Steve, thank you so much. Um, yeah. I've had fun because I just like talking to you, but. Uh, Hopefully we, we help people out. Oh, I brought this book over from my shelf. Um, Principles of Floriculture by, I think, Edward White, edited by Liberty, Liberty High Bailey. 103-year-old book. There's like 20 pages on mums. Mums have been grown for millennia. They are, you know, even in ancient Chinese and Japanese art, you see mums. They, you know, they're, they're native to Asia. They've been bred and bred and bred. Um, they've been with us a long time. So if you're having trouble finding information, maybe look back. Uh, 90s and earlier when before our cut flower industry initially collapsed in the US, you'll find plenty of information. Every university was supporting their local growers on growing mums. So there's a lot of information out there. The old information is still perfectly applicable today. The plants haven't really changed. Um, but you're picking up a tradition that's been going on a long time and I, I, don't know, I like feeling a part of part of the history of cut flowers. Oh yeah. Right. Yes. All right. Best wishes to you all. Can't wait to see you in St. Louis. And uh, thanks for all you're doing. We're excited to get some more moms into more people's hands. Thank you, Ben. It was great to see you. Bye, Thomas. <laughs> Thomas says bye. <laughs> I wish we were having cocktails right now. Oh, it's, it's noon. <laughs> it's one. All right. All right, see ya. See you guys. Bye-bye. All right, all. Thanks again if you've uh, placed orders this week. Um, we still have a lot of availability of most everything. We sold out of some of the perennials early, but we have a lot of others. Um, the seed grown stuff, Lysianthus, we actually started with a better supply of Lysianthus and eucalyptus seed than we've had in years. So even some of the more uh, exclusive varieties are still very much available. Email us at info at farmerbailey.com. We're here to help. Um, and we tend to get back to you pretty fast. You know, we have, we've got quite, we have, we have the dream team, I think. So, all right, best wishes. On on the rest of your season. Thanks.